Hello there, everyone. Um, we are go- well, this is actually a special edition of the weekly. Um, this is so this is different to the normal one that we do where we round up the week. Um, I am actually going to be uh, winding down um, over the next week or two. Um, only to, but I don't worry, I will be coming back again, um, you know, coming into September. Um, but um, I thought that it would be quite now would be quite a good good time um to have a look at what we think may happen in the final quarter of this year now um i normally um over the years i have been talking when i talk about quarters um i talk about q1 so i will abbreviate them often to say q1 q2 q3 uh, etc and um i noticed that when i was talking to ralph that actually ralph says 1q 2q 3q 4q right so i thought i know and, and i thought that actually this might be interesting for you so we're going to start off quickly by talking about that as so why i say q2 why he says it 2q and then we're also going to promise uh, i can also promise this podcast is going to get better exactly and but anyway <laughs> we are then going to be talking about much more serious things about politics where we think that things are going to go for the rest of uh, the year economics energy policy and uh, retail uh, prospects for retail so anyway and also it's so hot in here i've got i have even got the wind yeah, I have got the window uh, open, got the fan on, and I've got this as well because it's got to cool me down. Um, so anyway, uh, anyway, so there we go. So, um, Ralphie, what, how, first of all, how are you? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. I haven't got a beer, but uh, I'm good. I'm good. Excellent, excellent. Did I mention um, that I had a knee operation? Uh, you may you may well have done. Just uh, hmm, no, okay. Know, well, okay. Um, anyway, um, so you, but you're getting better, though. Yeah, yeah, fine, fine. Good, Let's not talk good. about this anymore. Okay, that cool. was just last. Uh, cool. Cool. So, okay. quarters. You wish to talk about yes. quarters? Yes. Why do you? So, why do? Well, so I talk about um, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. Why do you do 1Q, 2Q, 3Q, 4Q? Well, I, <laughs> I think it's an analyst thing. When I, when I was a professional analyst, what, what you needed to do is you needed to sort of communicate growth rates a lot to people, uh, both written and, of course, also in in your verbal communication with people when you're talking on the phone, etc. And it's not just the quarter within the year. You know, now we're obviously in 2022, so it's clearly obvious that Q1 will relate to 2022. Mm -hmm. But if you're an analyst, then you often have to compare this year to last year or even to the previous year. And Mm -hmm. then it gets very muddled if you say things like, well, Q120 versus Q119, because it's starting to sound like a number. 119 Mm -hmm. is like 119. And then, of course, if you say something like uh, growth... Q120 over Q119 was 20%. I mean, you're just drowning in a morass of digits and nothing means anything anymore. So that's the reason that I say uh, growth 1Q20 over 1Q19 was 10%. It's slightly more structured. It's slightly better in my view. And that was sort that's sort of, I think, how most of the city talked about it. I mean, I read my competitors' notes to... Uh, understand why they were wrong and I was right. Of course um, you did. Of course you did, yeah. yeah. That is also how they referred to the yeah. quarters and it was certainly the house style in all of the houses that I, I worked in. And so, mm. um, yeah, that's that's basically that mystery solved. Very very good. Right, so um, for the going into the end of the year, um, let's, let's talk about, you know, the P word, uh, politics. Um, and we'll just have a quick um, sort of uh, uh, scoot around the world, if indeed one can, um, on, on this front. So what do you think um, will be happening with Russia and Putin going into the end of the year? Though? Yeah, I, I, unfortunately, we can't ignore it. We have to talk about it. It's still dominating pretty much everything. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, You need to drink some of this. Yeah, I do. Can, can I have a sip? Yeah, hold on. There, there you go. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go near there. <laughs> yes. So, um, and um, what? What? The, the, yes, it's it's a. Of course, it's it's a transient situation. It's in flux. It develops. Yeah. It's very difficult for people like us who rely on uh, journal 
journalistic information to actually make a forecast. But mm. what I said previously is sort of what I still think. I think in one of the previous podcasts, I was sort of leaning myself out of the window a little bit much. And I was saying that this year, we're going to get to some form of treaty or, or peace mm. offering by, by Putin. Mm. Uh, well, this may be a little bit too optimistic, but I think the dynamics behind that statement are still mm. are still in play. And what I observe is that Russia is finding it difficult to withstand the current ferocity of the onslaught. It might be difficult to make that statement if you just look at the news. But if you look at the news in detail and you see where these various campaigns are now being fought, then Ukraine has deliberately opened up another front in the south around Kurzon. Mm -hmm. um, and Russia had to redeploy some of its forces from the east to that front. And they wouldn't have needed to do that if they did not, let's say, run at capacity. I'm, mm. I'm not saying they're going to run out of steam. I don't know how much wish for thinking that is. Mm. But certainly it looks to me as if the Russian forces in the Russian campaign in the Ukraine, well, let's say, cannot be stepped up anymore from the current uh, energy which we're seeing there. Mm. Mm. And the consequence of that is, I think, that Putin will need to do everything in his power to break the supply chain, which is currently going into the Ukraine, and is increasingly working a lot better. Mm. I'm actually thinking this is turning out to be a war of supply chains. Mm. Russia is still remarkably... Well, I don't know whether I should say the word incompetent. I, I can't judge this, but it looks incompetent in, um, in, in keeping up and building up its supply chains, even mm. now. And of mm. course, the Ukraine is relying on, on, a, on, a, on an intact and uninterrupted supply chain from the West. Mm. So I think Putin is, of course, going to see that too. And in order to dilute Western unity in uh, supporting, keeping up this supply chain, keeping up the flow of weapons into the Ukraine, he may well announce a complete ban of Russian oil and gas into mm. Europe. Mm -hmm. Now, he's sort of done this already. He's cut the pipeline into Germany for, air quotes, maintenance issues. And mm -hmm. even if he doesn't announce something like this as an explicit policy, I would not be surprised in the slightest if he were to announce that maintenance is going to take a very long time indeed. Mm. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. so yeah. obviously, if that were to happen, I think what he would be trying to do is to yeah, as I say, dilute the unity of the Western, of the European, but also the US, especially the European countries, uh, and therefore win over the Ukraine by hoping that the Ukrainian supply chain is going to crumble. Hmm. And in terms of 4Q, here we are. Here we go. Not See? Q4. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. In, uh, in terms of 4Q22, you see, that's yeah. the reason why. Yeah. Uh, anyway, in terms of the, of the fourth quarter, Yes. Uh, I would believe that if such a move were to happen or if the maintenance of the pipeline continues, uh, then we are going to feel the first impact of such a policy in the fourth quarter, both in terms of economics, mm. uh, but also in terms of pressure on political unity, which is already crumbling, I think. Mm. Mm. No, interesting. Um, I mean, obviously, it's it, it, it's it, we're in a fluid situation. Um, I mean, I I can't really add much to to what you say there. I mean, I I think I think that's that's absolutely correct. But I don't know. Obviously, yeah, we'll see. We'll see whether we'll see how that um, turns out. Hmm. Um, okay, so let's move on to Europe. I mean, I think with Europe. Hmm. Um, there's a, obviously there's a lot going on at the moment, and we are seeing um, the supplies, obviously uh, the energy supplies to Europe, um, severely restricted at the moment. And I think that obviously this is causing a lot of problems. Um, it actually cut off, so Russia cut off supplies to essentially uh, to Central Europe, um, so mm -hmm. made it made it very difficult for them. Um, and I think that if you, if one of the, uh, aims of his invasion, uh, of Ukraine was to 
break Europe up um, or at least cause it problems, it seems to be working quite well um, <laughs> because he's, you know, obviously driving a wedge between so Central and Eastern Europe and, and Western Europe. Um, he's driving, um, uh, you know, he, he's again driving a wedge between um, the supporters of or those a bit more sympathetic um, towards Moscow and those that aren't. Um, and Italy is a great example of that because, of course, Italy has traditionally been probably the most, the closest of the big Western nations to Russia in terms of sort of political support and things. Um so, you know, it's driving a wedge between everyone and it seems to be working quite well with the idea that presumably if you've got a split um, opposition, essentially, um, it makes it easier for you to roll out your own agenda. So mm -hmm. um, so I think in terms of, you know, what what are the pro yeah, so what what do you think are the prospects for for the fourth quarter? Yes, <laughs> I, I almost yes, said Q4, uh, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, th this is sort of um, what I was, what I was leading towards. I mean, the way in which a complete ban of oil and gas from Russia to Europe would put pressure on political parties and politicians mm. in Europe is precisely in the way you just outlined. Um, because, well, <laughs> we've talked about it for a long time and everybody knows this, of course, this cost of living crisis, discretionary incomes are melting, people can't heat their homes, etc. The existential, the uh, financial crisis is becoming existential for some households. Mm -hmm. And these households are not all of them, but some households amongst them are going to be easy prey mm -hmm. for the messages of populists. Mm -hmm. And that is what we're seeing already, uh, notably in Italy, mm -hmm. with the split up of the five star party, mm -hmm. um, where basically populists are, um, and, and I would claim deliberately exploiting the current crisis mm -hmm. in order to find support in a population which is just generally uh, disappointed by developments and um, is facing existential issues. Now, that is not only the case in Italy. We've seen this in France in the run-up to the presidential elections where Le Pen mm. very cleverly fought the political campaign not on issues of racism mm. um, and um, um, immigration, but on issues of household income. Mm. And we know that Le Pen had a very good run mm. into the presidential elections. Now we see that although Macron has been able to maintain his uh, presidency, he's lost the majority mm. of his party in, uh, in, in, in Congress. Mm. Um, and, well, that's probably the wrong word, in the... Uh, Assemblée Nationale mm. in Parliament, mm -hmm. and um, and therefore you have pressure points there. Yeah. And Putin is, I'm sure, seeing all this. Moving to the UK, there the op the 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 uh, situation is obvious to all of us. We've just um, well, not we. The Conservative Party has just ousted Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. We're having the hustings currently uh, to elect the next one. It is looking as if Liz Truss is mm. appealing more to the grassroots of the Conservative Party than Rishi Sunak. And I would claim that the reason for that is, again, a dose of populism. Mm. Mm. Because Liz Truss is promising, uh, well, not the citizens of the country, because this is not where the hustings are directed, mm. but the grassroots of the Conservative Party, mm -hmm promising that the crisis is going to be short-term alleviated simply by uh, tax reductions. And she's doing this in a in an almost ideological way. When, when you listen to her, she often says in the debates, she often says things like raising taxes or keeping taxes as an, at an elevated level is unconservative. Mm. Well, that's not a good argument. I mean, whether something is unconservative, not conservative, is not the issue. This shouldn't be the issue. Mm -hmm. What should be the issue is whether <clears throat> um, whether an economic crisis 
uh, can be alleviated by certain policy or not. Mm. And so I can see that there is there there's a certain amount of populism which is being pandered in most European in, in many European countries at the moment, and that is I think the the wedge you were speaking of. Mm. That's the leverage which Putin must see he would potentially have. And again, so now I'm coming back to what I said earlier, that is the reason why I'm expecting him to uh, cut off oil and gas just in order to increase the pressure points mm. and hoping to drive a wedge be, e, e, into what is currently still a remarkable uh, united front mm. and dilute the united front and um, uh, obtain an advantage in his uh, invasion of the Ukraine. Right. Absolutely. So, yes, I mean, I, I think this we are in a very tricky situation um at the moment so yes i think that the um we'll talk about the the prospects sort of economic prospects in a minute um um for um for europe so what about asia then i mean i think asia's asia's quite interesting obviously we've got um china is causing a lot of um unease in in the region so you know you've got japan which which um after the assassination of its ex uh, of its um uh, previous prime minister, um, the upper house, they voted, um, you know, they, they um, put forward, well, they, they basically, they've made the, the vote has essentially made it easier for, to, for Japan to um, be more military, militarily, not aggressive, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, it will, it will free them up to get involved more. Uh, whereas, yeah. you know, the, the traditionally, um, since the, since the war, um, they, they've had this constitution. It's been known as a pacifist constitution. Um, and they're very much in, in the whole kind of we're defense, we're in defense mode. Um, but with recent, um, movements in not, not only from actually, China, but also North Korea as well, you know, doing um, Mm -hmm. firing missiles and things, um, you know, doing testing. Um, There is a lot more unease. Um, There is, I think that Japan's got, it's it's the most chance it probably has had since the war to actually change its constitution. Um, But all of this, central to all of this, is the whole... um, uh, uh, rising concerns in in the, in the Asia Pacific region about China potentially invading Taiwan. That was made um, more tr- <coughs> a, 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 into a trickier situation by the recent visit of Pelosi, um, which uh, which um, anno- annoyed China greatly. Um, I mean, my own sort of pet theory with that is um, that. I wonder where, you know, I thought that uh, Pelosi, the Pelosi visit was made at a particularly sensitive time um, because I feel that on a macro front, um, China is is in a, a not precarious position, but a more precarious position than it has been in the past, where you've had rising debt. Um, you've you've got a real estate sector which is in all sorts of problems, particularly China Evergrande, three hundred million, uh, sorry, three hundred billion dollars in debt. Um, it's all you know, and the, the the it's very the real estate sector in China is extremely important. It really touches everyone. Um, so there's all this kind of bad feeling. There's the feeling that constant, constantly getting locked down, you know, so they're, 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 they're just about picking up. Then they, then an, then a variant comes along. Everything's shut down. Um, the GDP, end of year GDP, a growth forecast looks of 5.5% looks very dodgy at the moment. So my argument has been that potentially, um, the Pelosi visit came at a, at a very sensitive time because I think that you know, in 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 case uh, some cases in the poll, a lot of cases in the past, that um, countries are most dangerous when things are going wrong internally um, on the domestic front, because then they are more inclined to maybe have a war or do something like that um, in order to galvanise some kind of nationalist spirit um, and potentially take the focus off the problems domestically and turn it into a, you know, us versus the world. Now, I know you, you actually um, said something very interesting on that point, I thought, um, Ralph, early, when we talked earlier. Did I really? You did. You did <laughs> um, about, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the only thing there, I mean, f- first of all, I, I think that is true. But I wonder 
to which extent that is more true for democratic mm. countries than it is for autocratic ones. Mm. Because if we need a war to unite um, domestic dissent, let's mm. say, where then obviously there has to be domestic dissent in the first mm. place. Mm. China is an autocratic communist country. There is no dissent. I mean, there may be, of course, there is dissent. There's a lot of dissent, as we've mm. seen in the um, violent protest in Hong Kong, mm. which just wouldn't die down. But there is no organized political mm. dissent. And there is no institutionalized dissent. Mm. And so China also, again, as evidenced by its clampdown, again, violent clampdown on the protests in Hong Kong, doesn't really need to wage a war outside of its, order, uh, outside of its borders to focus um, public opinion on it. It just needs to quash uh, violence through the application of violence. Mm. And it, so that is why I wonder whether that motivation might be as much an evidence in well, in any autocratic country, but specifically China, because we're talking about it. But but yes, I mean, you, you may be right. I mean, there may be a contributory factor. It certainly is the case that Xi Jinping is about to um, come into a new term. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly when it is. It should be now-ish mm -hmm. almost, uh, this month or certainly next. And clearly nothing is going to happen before then, but I do wonder what China might actually do. Um, actually, to be honest with you, in in the medium mm. term, by which I speak, still of ten mm. years, it, it it is militarily not so easy to invade Taiwan. Mm. Actually, because it is hundred kilometers off the coast, mm. and everything there has to be naval and um, and air based and again we're talking about supply yes of course the supply chain to the chinese border is unencumbered and cannot be uh, cannot be interrupted but this it is going to be more difficult than i think people may um, think to establish a lasting presence in taiwan anyway so in terms of 4q um, <laughs> i love all this i love this <laughs> <laughs> yeah go on <laughs> Now we're talking about longer term developments. They are difficult to anchor into a quarter. But in terms of 4Q, the, for, what I will say is this. I mean, 4Q is going to be after September, mm -hmm. <laughs> which means after we know who our yeah, new prime that's minister right, that's is. Right, yeah. That's the theme from the UK. Mm -hmm. And it will be after Xi Jinping is going to be uh, anointed into his, mm -hmm. his, his next term. Mm -hmm. And so I'm guessing that the discussion about these dynamics is going to be a lot more, let's say, tangible and is becoming a lot more, um, yeah, tangible is not a bad word, in terms of real rather than speculation, mm. uh, starting from the fourth quarter. Cool. Or, or perhaps starting from the first quarter, because fourth quarter is always the quarter with Christmas here mm -hmm. in, in the European mm. countries and in the free world, perhaps you can say. Uh, and so perhaps uh, the focus is not going to be that much on it. But I think starting from starting from these developments, starting from which coincide with the 4Q, uh, I think we're going to hear a lot more mm. of this. And the situation in Taiwan is going to be one which is going to be more obvious in focus mm. in the media and in the attention of the um, military institutions and, 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 um, and secret services. Okay, fair enough. By the way, I just all just wondered there um, when when you say 4Q, if this was <laughs> like you know when the, on YouTube they do uh, automated captions at the bottom, if you said 4Q in a certain way, would would an insult uh, you know kind of pop up in terms of the automated captions? Perhaps I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, um, so so. Um, are you are you talking about my German accent? No, I'm sir? not. I'm talking about. Oh yes, you no, I'm do. Not. I'm going to be offended no, 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 now no. because because this is another thing we need to talk about. Well, actually, we don't. It's a it's a business podcast, yeah. isn't it? But people are offended all the time. It's no, really it's, great fun it's, to be offended, funny, and I'm offended Good. now. In fact, I'm going no, to no, leave. Don't do oh, that. Don't do leave. that. Oh, don't do that. that. You're going to drive me to drink. Um, oh. so, <laughs> so anyway, sorry. So anyway, so the final one, of course, uh, the big one, uh, is the US. 
So, I mean, my yes. impression um, is that the, it's not been going particularly well. I did think it was quite interesting. I saw that, um, you know, that there was a, an email from um, Rula Kalaf from the um, FT who, who clearly, um, you know, emailed me just personally, along with her, uh, a few uh, hundred thousand of her closest friends, um, sort of basically saying something along the lines of, you know, he's on the verge of something historic, uh, signing, a, you know, a, a bill um, worth seven hundred billion dollars, etc. But I, I would actually argue that I don't think he has done particularly. I'm now, I'm not, you know, I, I'm looking, I'm, I'm go- coming at this as a neutral. I want him to do well, right? Because I really didn't like, um, I really didn't like uh, Donald Trump. Um, and I want him to do well. However, it seems to me that he bodges things. You know, he, um, you know, this this thing that, that he supposedly got together, the um, minimum corporation tax, minimum global corporation tax. I mean, you know, that seems to be falling apart at the moment. There's the uh, there are various other things. And then, of course, there's the very high profile um, Roe v. Wade, um, mm-hmm. which I think has been particularly bad then of course he's he sent pelosi over at, at, at you know uh, i don't know what he achieved there um at, at a very difficult time you know he he just seems to bodge and and make mistakes all the time but you know what do you think uh, are the prospects for um you know uh, politically uh in in the us mm. for the fourth quarter yes again the fourth quarter is interesting because it is after another mm-hmm. date like in the uk yeah, yeah, yeah. after september and uh, this time it is after the after november the 8th of november i believe is the date for the midterm mm-hmm. elections mm-hmm. and we're going to see whether uh, the democrats are going to be able to maintain their well they don't even have a lead in in the senate but it, it's just half and mm. half so whether they they're, they're going to maintain that position or whether they will have to accept a um a majority of uh, of republicans mm. and uh, given where the, the journey is going in america I would not be surprised in the slightest mm. if we'd see a renaissance of Republican majority mm. in the Senate. And that is, of course, going to be a problem because I think I agree with you. What I've seen so far from the Biden administration is um, where there's nothing really which they can point to as an mm. achievement, to be perfectly honest. I mean, the foreign foreign policy, foreign politics, foreign policy has been disastrous with the uh, exit from Afghanistan in mm-hmm. the way it was done. Um, arguably, the thing which they are doing well is supporting the Ukraine with a very material financial mm-hmm. package and, and weapons indeed. So that's on the mm. plus side. But also in terms of domestic policy, I can't see how the Biden administration is managing what increasingly looks to me to be a polarization of US society into a, well, in, 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 into a very conservative and a liberal part, mm-hmm. let's put it this way. It's actually quite hard to define what conservative means in this case. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a worldview which sees federal governments, federal policies as an illegitimate intrusion into your private mm-hmm. life. You know, that used to be what the Tea Party was stood for. That's what the sort of Milit- near militant Christianity and evang- evangelism, which we see in the US, uh, stands for. This is, of course, what Trump galvanized. Right. And it has already led to situations which 10 years ago would have we would have thought were mm. unthinkable, like a, a, an actual physical violent uh, invasion of the capital. Mm of the most sacred government building, seat Mm. of government uh, of Mm. the US. And so I I do wonder whether there is going to be a flashpoint somewhere. Events keep coming. You mentioned Roe v. Wade. 
which arguably perhaps that is not in the power of the executive. That's not mm, in the power yeah, true, of Biden yeah. to do anything mm. about, but it, it, it highlights where the fault lines run mm. in US society. Now, you, you just have to look on the map and see how many states have basically banned abortion and how many states have uh, allowed it mm. to happen. And, and, and so... So within that sort of volatile gas, if, if, if you like, of, of um, American society, I would have hoped for a leader who is able to unite the country more than Biden obviously mm. has done. And, and economically, I don't think the uh, so-called Rust Belt states, which helped him win this time, round and helped Trump win the previous time, they have not felt any meaningful economic improvement. Mm. And so if you take all of this together, I would not be surprised if uh, the Democrats lost their grip on Congress making any further political implementation of policy, sorry, any further implementation of policy in the second half of their uh, administrative term very difficult mm. indeed. Absolutely. I mean, it's difficult. It's been difficult enough already, hasn't it? But it, the possibility of it getting worse is, is, I think, has increased. But anyway, right. So that's <clears> politics. <throat> Let's move on to economics. What do you think? We're, we're going to be talking about recession, interest rates, inflation. So um, what do you reckon then? I mean, uh, where, where do you think we're going to go into a global recession? Oh uh, yeah, <clears throat> perhaps. I mean, in let, let's let's uh, let's look closer to home, perhaps uh, in in mm -hmm. Europe, uh, and I include the UK now in Europe territorially. So it, it might be a story of it's getting better before it mm -hmm. gets worse, un unfortunately. And and the reason for that is that after the COVID situation has abated to the level in which we're now in, uh, economies have reopened. And that reopening has produced, you know, a solid, I would say, a solid improvement in GDP mm -hmm. growth. It's, it's not massive, it's single digits, but it is visible. Um, and that happened in European countries even to a larger extent. Or it, it's a different phase. I, I, I think in Europe it happened, um, if you look at 2Q over 1Q, see yeah, how yeah. this works. You're not mm -hmm. confused, are you? 2Q22 over 1Q22, mm -hmm. that's sequential mm -hmm. growth. Uh, oh, yeah. Moving on. Anyway, th that's where that happened. And in the UK, mm -hmm. it happened in uh, previous sequential comparisons. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the UK is already running out of steam. Europe is still having the benefit of some momentum there. But if you look at all the dynamics which we have been discussing, which have been high, fo uh, highlighted by the press, which have been in focus in everybody's mind for the last several months. High inflation, high energy costs, discretionary income squeeze, high interest rates, mortgage goes up. I mean, nothing is good in summary. Therefore, I think consumer confidence is going to absolutely take a knock and people are going to have to keep their money together just in order to be able to mm. heat their homes. None of these things are conducive to economic growth. And so to me, it is certain that the European countries are going to slide into mm -hmm. recession. When that is going to happen is another question. It may not actually happen in the fourth quarter in 4Q22. Mm -hmm. It might happen in 1Q23, but I'm pretty sure it will happen mm -hmm. in 1Q23. Interesting. Oh, but by the way, just one word on this. There is a niggly, niggly kind of technical issue. I mean, a recession really only is, is technically present if you have two consecutive quarters of uh, contraction. Yes. And, and, and so, yeah, negative growth is yeah, what you yeah. normally say. And uh, so technically, we would have to wait for the second quarter, 23, in order to be able to say, okay, 2Q23 on 1Q23 was a contraction. Mm. 1Q23 on 4Q22 mm -hmm. was a contraction. That's now right, we're yeah. in recession. Yeah. So that's kind of how this yes, would need absolutely. to work. I mean, for, for what it's <laughs> worth, I mean, uh, in, in, very, very uh, briefly, um, I think firstly... Um, U.S. is in recession. Uh, it's in denial also mm -hmm. at the moment because it's making the rules up as it goes along. Um, the yeah. uh, I think um, 
I I personally believe that that Europe will go into recession in uh, quickly, more quickly than the UK. And the, the reason why I say that is because, well, there's a few reasons. What, well, the main reason is um, the energy problem. And I think that, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's a lot more manufacturing in Europe than there is in the UK. Uh, and therefore, they are much more exposed. Um, and therefore, I think that they will go down faster. So that's my that's my opinion uh, on that. And the other thing as well, I feel that a lot of the governments are are pretty in weak positions at the moment because they don't have majorities or they're having, you know, like Italy's having an election. And I mean, it's it, you know, and then you've got and you've got a three way coalition in Germany. All these kinds of things, I think, is going to make it harder for them to make the hard decisions and therefore they're more likely to fall in harder in my opinion in terms of the uk <laughs> um i think that we my my base case as it were is i feel that um we might hang on to uh the current quarter be okay but maybe the final quarter in in the uk may be may be difficult um and mm-hmm. therefore we would need to uh, further have see a contraction um in the first quarter as you say in order to have two consecutive quarters of contraction um i think that there's there's a couple of things that may help possibly um i think in the uk specifically so one is having a new leadership um i mean we don't know what the final policies are actually going to be um but you would have thought that um whoever it is, is going to want to try to pep up the the country and try to be more popular um, and therefore may be more inclined to do things that do stimulate the economy. So I think there's an outside chance that actually things may get better um, or, you know, may conceivably get better because they're a new, uh, uh, say, a new administration and therefore they have an excuse to, say, ditch things that maybe haven't worked and try something else so possibly i don't know um and so uh, so I, I would say that that's that's one thing and then the other thing of course is that we are not as reliant on russia for our energy as europe so i still think though that we will get fall into recession um but i think it's more likely um next year than it is this year so there we go um mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I believe that's right. It's it's more likely next yeah. year than this year. Especially also, do do you think that maybe we're going to get a decent uh, shot in the arm from a reasonably strong Christmas? Um, I wonder whether we are going to. Uh, again, I, someone was asking me this the other day, and I think that um, although, see, I I seem to remember that last Christmas everyone was getting excited about it. You know, lots of spending going on. Um, and then we saw lots of, uh, say, uh, uh, so in the in the leisure sector, you saw, uh, or uh, you you saw uh, restaurants and pubs and things. They're all seeing bookings rising. And I remember actually, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I've got um, Watson's Daily Ambassadors, um, um, you know, working with me, and we were going to do a Christmas party and everything, um, but it had to, you know, it had to get cancelled. Everyone had to cancel because Omicron uh, came along. And so I think that yeah. although that was almost a good, that, I mean, I it for me it was a good Christmas, but I think for a lot of people it looked like it was going to be a great Christmas, and then it it sort of got downgraded. So I think there is there is an outside chance that people are going to throw caution to the wind potentially this Christmas. They're going to you know they're going to go out, they're going to spend, and yes, they're going to go more into debt. Uh, they're going to use credit more. And then we are going to see the big dose of reality going into next year. I mean, I think that at the moment everyone yeah. is feeling. I mean, I know, I know, I'm feeling the bills on the, you know, on the food front, um, and certainly um, on on the uh, on on the utilities bills front as well. So I mean, I'm, I'm already feeling it at the moment. Mm. Um, but I think that yes, there is a chance that that may happen and that we may be okay. Uh, potentially, you know, they, we might get a little bit of a boost at the end of the year, uh, but then, like I say, the beginning of next year will be will be tough. Yeah, yeah, I think these are going to be the dynamics. I, I kind of expect a reasonable mm-hmm. Christmas, to be honest, which is almost going to ensure that we're going to see a technical recession in the first quarter because it's going to be compared to a tough yeah. comparable. Uh, so f- fourth quarter is going to go up a little bit, and then f- first quarter is going to go down more than that because of energy bills coming in 
And uh, the other quick thought I wanted to share with you guys is the next question is then all, also, of course, how long is that good? recession going to last and how severe mm -hmm. is it going to be? And of course, mm -hmm. I have no idea, but just one benchmark for this. The last uh, recessionary dynamic we've, we've seen, which is now called the Great European mm -hmm. Recession, uh, was in 2008 coinciding with yeah. the financial crisis. And that lasted mm -hmm. for two years, which is very long mm -hmm. indeed by uh, sort of modern standards. Um, and I think the reduction from maximum to minimum was something like two percentage mm -hmm. points. Um, now, so it may be that we're not going to have such a lasting recession as two years. I, I'm sort of currently penciling in maybe a year, which mm -hmm. is actually quite uh, an quite a conservative mm -hmm. expectation already um, but so that's what we're going to see more highlighted in the in in, in the press in commentary as we mm. go into next absolutely year. so that's just what i'm going to say in terms of our commercial awareness i don't know where it's going to be but we can be sure that mm. that's going to be a topic uh, which is going to start as as mm. early as we go into next now. Year. I mean, I just wanted to introduce a, a, a thought to, uh, to people. Um, now, uh, this may be completely wrong, but I just thought it was interesting to bring up, and is and that is, um, I, you know, everyone is kind of assuming that we are going to be falling into recession, and say, you know, that it's going to go badly into the end of the year, um, but. I wonder what would happen if, uh, you know, the concert, the leadership changed to this country. They brought in um, various measures, and maybe by the skin of our teeth, we can make it to the end of the year without uh, our GDP growth contracting. So, if that happens, I would expect the politicians concerned to say, "Hey, look, everyone! Everyone else has gone into recession." We haven't, you know, we're leading you through. Therefore, feel more confident. Go out and spend. We're going to save you. Now, I mean, I know it's not going to be quite like that, but, you know, I think it'd be quite interesting to think about what would happen if we didn't contract. I mean, it looks like we are going to, but if we didn't, I don't think anyone's really expecting it. So, you know, I just thought I'd, I'd throw that in. Um, in terms of a, you know, like a, uh, to, you know, just just to try to give an opposing argument potentially um, for what might happen going into the end of the year. But anyway, but there you go. I know you. you go, go, going into yeah. the end of the year, I think you may actually mm. even be right because the recession, I think we also agreed, may actually take mm. hold next year. But. Um, well, I'm un unhappy to report that mm. I'm pessimistic on on your take simply because the realities will be that energy yeah. bills are going to spiral. So a, a politician who just basically says, oh, look, we are not in recession, everybody else is. Yes, of course, they mm. will say that because mm. the politicians, but as long as the politician, uh, sorry, politician, the, the government will not be able to support people and help them with mm. their energy bills in a in a meaningful way and in a means mm -hmm. tested mm -hmm. way, by the way, it's no good to give mm. everybody 400 quid. If I had 10 properties that hand me mm. 4,000 quid, you know, but then clearly I'd be rich mm. and I wouldn't need this. So it needs mm. to be mean tested help. Unless a government is able to do that, I don't think the uh, citizenry mm. of a country will necessarily support yeah. such a government, but we will have to see. So yeah. I'm more pessimistic yeah, yeah. than no. I normally am. Well, no, no, fair, next year, fair I, enough. I, I fair enough. Say. And which actually, I mean, I suppose it leads us into the last thing about in, in energy policy, um, and just to say, hmm. you know, what what we what we think about that. I mean, I. I, would, I really think you're right. I think that the whole thing about um, it, it needs to be means tested. Um, I was talking about this the other day. I know I was saying to someone, it's a bit like everyone getting a free bus pass when they reach retirement age, whether you're a billionaire or whether you're not. Um, 
you know, it's always been a bit ridiculous that. And I kind of think that the same thing applies or will apply here. And I feel that what needs to be done, I mean, I feel that it's a bit defeatist of the government to say, well, you know, it's logistically really difficult and we can't do it. Um, we can't give it to certain sectors of, of, of the, of society. But I think that that's a poor excuse. You know, I, I feel that, you know, what we need to do is to find a way of actually doing that. And I, I think there's more ways. I Surely there are more ways now that all, you know, data and stuff is going more online. We can an analyze these things much more efficiently than, than in the past. And I would have, in my naivety, think, thought that, um, you know, it should be easier. And if it isn't, it should be made easier. And um, it won't just mm. be for things like this. It could be for all sorts of things that a some kind of framework whereby um, you have a more robust way of distributing taxes or, you know, that sort of thing. It would be so much more efficient. Um, so I kind of think in my ideal, you know, my ideal world is that maybe the government, you know, gives goes to the um, uh, the utilities companies and throws the money at them to make sure that our bills are don't go uh, to ridiculous levels for say let's say three to six months, which would take us kind of towards the end of of, of winter. Um, and then after that, you know, or during that period, they work out something, a way that they can do, they can do this distribution, start implementing it in, say, March, April next year. And then it means that if anything like this happens again, um, the, this can be, there can be more even distribution. Um, but anyway, I mean, that's obviously my, uh, sort of, um, uh, uh, pie in the sky, you know, hopeful vision, etc. Um, but anyway, I mean, what do you think about energy policies? What should be? Well, I mean, I, I, absolutely. I mean, it, it it should be possible. I mean, for, first of all, the the idea that it is somehow philosophically uh, unjust to just target a group of people is is completely mm. ridiculous because there are direct taxes in every mm. country, in every tax uh, system, and that's completely proper. Like road tax, for example, I have to pay road tax because I am the owner of a vehicle, which mm. I use on public roads. Somebody doesn't have a public, sorry, somebody doesn't have a vehicle and therefore doesn't use up the public good public roads, doesn't mm. have to pay the tax. And, and that's mm. fine. You, you see, this is a direct tax um directed at a group of people and so philosophically this mm. is absolutely fine and there shouldn't be an issue with this because mm -hmm. nobody has an issue with this claiming that somebody has an issue with this is, mm -hmm. is disingenuous so when the second point then is it should be bureaucratically or administratively possible to do this because we do have a progressive tax mm -hmm. system already and uh, therefore different groups of people are taxed in in, in different orders of magnitude so I think it, it really should be not an mm, insurmountable mm. problem to direct um, financial support to households who are in need of mm -hmm. such support and only mm -hmm. to such households. And, and if um, it needs to be done by way of a tax reduction, then, then what otherwise would be a support could be perhaps a, a percent, a tenth of a percentage point mm -hmm. reduction mm -hmm. in somebody's income tax, which is not going to be an income tax reduction per se. It's just the equivalent mm -hmm. of directing um, a, a support, an aid package to somebody mm -hmm. who's in mm -hmm. need of it. So it mm -hmm. makes it means tested. I mean, that, that should all be possible to do, and it will be interesting to see to which extent the next prime minister in our country is going mm. to do this. I mean, Rishi Sunak has just uh, revealed a 10 billion pound um, scheme aiming to do something like that, whereas Liz Truss has been more silent on this, um, which in itself I don't understand and may mm. not bode well for a a government under 
under Liz Truss. But but we will have to see. I mean, first of all, she's not prime minister yet, and then mm. we'll just have to judge her. If mm. if she were to be prime minister, we just have to judge her yeah. by her actions. But I I agree that would be something mm. which I would certainly very much support. And I think it should also be possible to do that through, for example, also direct, more directed way of redistribution. I don't think a windfall tax on energy companies is such a bad, bad, mm. big no-no, but I fear that the Conservative Party is becoming more ideological and doesn't really want to do this because it is seen to be, air quotes, mm. unconservative, not because it is seen to have a potential negative income on the mm. economy if such mm. an argument could well, be fair made. Enough. Well, there we go. I mean, I think we'll leave it there. Um, I mean, we've talked about, you know, um, uh, kind of how confidence and um, what can potentially happen towards the end of the year, um, covered uh, energy, etc. So, I mean, obviously, we've covered quite a lot of ground, I think, uh, in today's. And um, hmm. I just think it's, it's good, you know, as, as food for thought. And I think that we will... Um, be revisiting these thoughts um, at regular intervals, you know, obviously over over these podcasts. Um, but yes, um, uh, is there anything else you wanted to say, Ralph, at all? No, uh, the only thing is that I think Peter Watson yeah. is going on holiday. Yeah, yeah, for the yeah. First time I mean, in this, 10 is, years. this is amazing. This is another reason for the um, sort of winding down um, o- over the next week or, or two. So next week, I am going to be writing Watson's Daily as normal, but I'm not going to be doing all the the posting of the um, all the social media stuff and the podcast. Uh, and then I'm going away for, uh, for a week, um, which, I mean, I still almost can't quite believe but um that'll be great and then we'll come back again hit the ground running and um yeah i'm looking forward to it you, you you're going to do something really cool aren't you like backpacking in Kathmandu mm, or downhill biking in no, whistler aren't no. you aren't no you, Peter? Uh, not, not quite we do you want to tell um, us what you're going to do disneyland paris so yeah <laughs> so um actually i said that to someone to <laughs> I got, and, uh, I got him Paris. to say it. It's so funny because um, actually I was talking to someone today. I went, went to a shop uh, to, to, today um, and we were having a conversation. I was having a conversation with the person at, at the counter and I said, oh, you know, I'm going away. It, my first holiday for 10 years. She said, oh, where are you going? I said, Disneyland Paris. She said, oh, what a nice person. You know, you're you're thinking of the kids. Um, you, you know, you're not going to where you want to go. And I was thinking, yeah. But actually, I kind of do want to go. Actually, <laughs> so so that's oh, quite good. So, okay. um, but um, but yeah, I mean, I'm 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 really looking forward to it, and it'd be nice just to, yeah. I mean, you know, have a holiday. To be honest, look, it should actually be really cool. I I was yeah. at Disney World in Florida uh, for the wedding of yeah. my nephew-in-law, and it was really fun. There were water parks and everything. No, I'm, it, I'm, it I'm looking cool. forward to it's it. Fun. But anyway, yes, we'll see. But anyway, cool. thank you very much. As always, always a cool. brilliant pleasure to have you on this, Ralph. And uh, um, thank you, Peter. For and um, me. we'll be back. Um, we'll be back very soon. Um, we're gonna. We've got a few little surprises up our sleeves um, for you as well. So um, yeah. keep watching because there's some quite. There's some pretty good, cool stuff coming your way. And uh, anyway, right. Okay. <laughs> cool thanks stuff very much on. indeed. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Cool. All right. Bye. Cheers. Cheers, Bye. guys. Cheers, Peter.